Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. My wife decided to move to the so-called syndicate and regretted it. Today's story has a similar plot. Enjoy it! My name is Robert Rob Price, and my wife's name is Alexandra Alex, not Sandy. I'm 5 feet 10 inches, and Alex is 5 feet 6 inches. I weigh about 190 pounds and stay in shape by running and working out at the gym twice a week. Alex's friend once said I was a bit handsome. Alex weighs about 110 pounds and also goes to the gym. I have brown hair and blue eyes, while Alex has blonde hair and brown eyes. We are both 34 years old, though Alex looks more like she's 28, while people tell me I look my age. To me, Alex is the most beautiful woman in the world, and my whole world revolves around her and our two children, Samantha, who is 10, and Carl, who is 8. I have degrees in engineering and business management and work for a local company in our small town, which has fewer than 10,000 people. Alex was a nurse at our local hospital, but now she's the head nurse and earns good money. I work in middle management and have been told that when the boss retires, I will take over his position, so our future looks promising. We met at a party and immediately liked each other. We made love on our second date and got married six months later. Alex had initially said she didn't want children because she wanted to travel and see the world, but things didn't go according to plan. A few months later, she became pregnant. It seems the pills aren't always reliable. Samantha was born eight months later, and Carl was born two years after that. We decided that travel would have to wait until the kids were off to college, but I noticed Alex wasn't happy about the delay. To compensate, I tried to book trips abroad to give her a taste of what the future held. Throughout our marriage, we had the usual arguments, usually about money. Alex would say I didn't make enough money and needed a better paying job. I argued that my boss would retire soon, and then I'd get a promotion, and money would no longer be an issue. Our biggest fight happened when she returned home with a brand new BMW X3, which she bought on credit. I was furious and asked how we could afford it. She said that she had been promoted to department head, and since it was her money, she decided to please herself. I should have understood then what would happen next, but I didn't. With hindsight, of course, everything is clearer. We didn't talk for a week, and she said I ruined her joy and kept her at a distance for a month. In the end, we made peace and agreed to discuss all major purchases in the future. Life went on, and we were approaching our 11th year of marriage. We'd been arguing a lot lately, as usual, about money and why it was never enough. I decided we needed to reconnect away from all the worries of home, so I booked a trip to the Bahamas for two weeks. I sold one of the rare stamps from my father's collection, which he left to me after his death. I didn't know how much they were worth, so I sent them in for an appraisal. When I told Alex about the trip, she was delighted and immediately began shopping for a new wardrobe. I still don't know where she found the money because she had her own account. On the day of departure, we took the children to her parents and drove to the airport, parking the car in the long-term parking lot. On the plane, she held my hand and told me how much she loved me, saying I'd be lucky that night. When we arrived at the hotel, we were quickly shown to our room. I couldn't afford a suite, it was only an 11-meter room, so we went for a walk to explore the area. We had a great view of the bay and could see the yacht dock. I've always liked boats, so I looked with interest at the moored yachts and those anchored nearby. Two of them were about 200 yards from the shore, one was a sailing yacht that could be sailed alone thanks to new technology, and the other was more like a small vessel that required a crew of several people. While walking, Alex spotted a restaurant on stilts overlooking the bay and said it would be fun to dine there someday. I agreed, and we continued to walk along the embankment, looking into tourist shops and expensive boutiques. I was glad Alex didn't go into the boutiques, as that would have put a serious dent in our budget. We had lunch at a nice seafood restaurant and returned to the hotel. Alex wanted to take a shower and get dressed for dinner. When she came out of the shower, she looked incredibly cute. I also took a shower and changed clothes. We had dinner at the hotel restaurant and then went to the bar, where there was live music and a dance floor. The bar was full of tourists, and everyone was having fun. When Alex was ready for bed, it was already after 1 o'clock in the morning. We went up to the room, and Alex put on a pretty nightgown and got into bed. 
I went to the bathroom to brush my teeth, and when I came back, she was fast asleep. I lay down next to her and also fell asleep. In the morning, when I woke up, Alex was already dressed and ready for breakfast. She hurried me to get dressed as quickly as possible. I was hoping for some morning intimacy, but once again, to no avail. So, I quickly showered, got dressed, and we went to breakfast. After breakfast, we went on a tour with a local tour company. It was a wonderful day, and after lunch, Alex decided to sunbathe by the pool. I don't like sitting still, so I went for a walk along the shore toward the out harbor and watched the boats come and go. This relaxed me, and I found a small cafe where I ordered coffee on the street. There, I decided to surprise Alex and booked a table for dinner at that very restaurant on stilts. When I got back to the hotel, Alex was no longer at the pool, so I called her on her cell phone. She immediately answered and said she was in the room and had prepared a surprise for me. I hurried to the room, hoping that I would finally get lucky, but when I opened the door, I saw her dressed and smiling. I tried not to show my disappointment. Hello, dear. As a token of gratitude for this wonderful vacation, I have prepared a little surprise for you, she said, handing me a small brown envelope. When I opened it, there was an all-day fishing ticket for the coming Friday. I love fishing but didn't think much of it, since this vacation was planned as an opportunity to reconnect. I thanked her, picked her up, and kissed her on the lips, but she pulled away. Later, she said. I was disappointed but didn't press the issue. I booked us a table at a restaurant on stilts, I said. She smiled and said, today, you will definitely be lucky. I was skeptical but didn't pursue the topic, since the restaurant looked quite fancy. We dressed up in our best clothes and headed out. When we arrived at the restaurant and approached the counter, I reported our reservation. The host called the head waiter, who came up to us. I explained that I had made a reservation for two that afternoon under the name Price. He flipped through the register, found our reservation, but said with regret, Unfortunately, your reservation was recently cancelled, and we have already given the table to others. He raised his hands in apology and added that there was nothing he could do and that he was very sorry. I looked at Alex, and she looked like she wanted to collapse into the ground in shame. At that moment, a man approached us and asked the head waiter what the problem was. The head waiter explained the situation, and while they were talking, I looked around the room. We were truly out of our element. The suits and dresses of the other guests would have cost me a month's salary. I looked closely at the man who was talking with the head waiter. He looked to be about 40 years old, was fit, and wore a perfectly tailored suit. He looked at us and said, it would be a shame if such a wonderful couple were turned away because of some stupid mistake. It would be my great pleasure if you would join me at my table. I tried to refuse, but he insisted, saying that he hated dining alone and that it would be a favor for him. I looked at Alex and saw that she wanted to accept his invitation, so I thanked him, and he asked the head waiter to prepare two seats for us. He helped Alex sit down, and the waiter handed over the menu. The man introduced himself as Juice Godier, and I introduced Alex and myself. We sat down, and I realized I had made a mistake when I saw the prices on the menu. Juice noticed my embarrassment and, correctly understanding the reason, put his hand on my shoulder, looked at Alex, and quietly said, For your wife, please. Then he added louder, this is my gift as a token of gratitude for your company. Alex looked a little embarrassed but said nothing and dove into the menu. I felt uncomfortable and decided to order the cheapest dishes. Alex, however, felt no remorse and ordered what she wanted. When I saw what she chose, I realized how lucky I was, her entree cost over $100. Throughout the dinner, Juice maintained a casual conversation, involving me in it. We talked about everything, work, family, life goals. When asked what he did, he replied, nothing, then explained that he was a billionaire and spent his time traveling the world, visiting whatever places he wanted at any moment. I saw Alex's eyes fill with dreaminess and heard her sigh of envy. We continued talking for another three hours, mostly about our goals in life. Alex, of course, said that she had always wanted to travel and see the world, but the birth of Samantha and Carl had stopped those plans. When she said this, she gave me a skating look and then turned away. Juice, to his credit, pretended not to notice. As the evening drew to a close, 
Jews insisted that we have breakfast with him on his yacht, Lady Jane, and then head to a small island for snorkeling. Before I could say anything, Alex agreed, and our day tomorrow was planned. Juice said he would meet us at the pier at 7 a.m. We said goodbye, he went to his yacht, and we went to our hotel. When we returned to the hotel, I suggested we have a cocktail and dance a little. Alex said she was too tired and wanted to go to bed, so we went to the room. As soon as we entered the room, Alex began to reproach me. I've never been so embarrassed in my life, and you just stood there. If it weren't for Juice, we would have simply been sent away. Don't ever humiliate me like that again. Why can't you be like Juice and go after what you want instead of waiting until your boss retires? Juice gets whatever he wants. Now, I'm going to bed, and you can forget about your luck today or even this week. Without waiting for an answer, she went into the shower and then went to bed, turning her back to me. I lay in bed for several hours, thinking this vacation was supposed to be an opportunity for a reunion, but everything had gone wrong. The more I thought, the more I came to the conclusion that everything was coming to an end. I could no longer tolerate her constant disrespect and nagging. If by the end of the vacation nothing changes, we will either have to go to a family psychologist or go to court. With this decision, I finally fell asleep at 5.30 a.m., and we were woken up by a call from the reception. By 7 a.m., we were already at the pier. Juice was waiting for us and helped Alex into the small motorboat. I followed the boat as it took us to a large yacht, which I had noticed on the first day. We approached a small pier, from where we went up the steps to the deck, where a sailor met us and led us to a set table for three. Breakfast was light, coffee, croissants, rolls, and butter. Juice said it was better to eat something light before swimming. After breakfast, we weighed anchor and went out to the open sea. We stopped in a small bay on one of the islands and dropped anchor again. Juice asked if I dived, and I replied that I hadn't dived in a long time. He suggested I dive with one of the crew members so I wouldn't have to dive alone. I was delighted and asked Alex if she would mind. She replied that she didn't care what I did, she was going to sunbathe. Another example of disrespect, this time in front of a person we barely knew. Juice, as usual, pretended not to notice anything, although several crew members looked shocked. A crew member and I put on our gear and descended from the diving platform at the stern into the water. I noticed that Alex went swimming with Juice without saying goodbye to me. I spent half an hour exploring the reef and found some beautiful shells for Alex. I thought it would be a nice souvenir to bring home. When I returned, I took off my gear and changed into shorts and a t-shirt. Alex and Juice were sitting at a table on the beach that the crew had brought ashore. When I joined them, Alex looked like she had just won a competition, and Juice seemed a little embarrassed. I briefly wondered what this meant but quickly forgot when the crew served lunch, fresh lobster, salad, and delicious white wine. After lunch, we discussed our swim and my dive. I went to get the shells to show them to Alex and solemnly placed them in front of her. I found these for you, thought you might like to bring them home. Jews interrupted me. Sorry, Rob, but these shells are protected. They need to be returned to the water. Alex looked at me mockingly. You couldn't even do that right. You're useless. I was absolutely depressed and just walked to the other end of the beach. The walk back to our room was silent. The next day, I woke up and Alex had already left. There was a note. She had gone shopping and would not return until tonight. There was no love, and in fact, there was no signature at all. We barely spoke for the rest of the week, and she left every day until the evening. When I asked where she had been, she simply answered, walking. I noticed new items with designer tags and asked how much they cost. You didn't pay for them, so it's none of your business. From this conversation, I concluded that Juice had paid for them, and I got a bad feeling in my stomach. On Thursday, when I woke up, she was already out of the house again. I wondered if she had slipped me something because I usually don't sleep that long. That evening, she returned later than usual and my calls went straight to voicemail. I left her a message asking her to call me back, but she never responded. I waited for her and when she finally came in, it was already after midnight. Where have you been? I was worried about you. If you really need to know, I was with Jews all day. We went shopping, had lunch, had dinner on his yacht, then went to the club, and he just gave me a lift. 
By the way, do you like my new dress? Juice bought it for over $5,000. At least he knows how to treat women. And before you ask, no, I didn't sleep with him. Now I'm tired and going to bed. If you want to talk, I'll see you when you get back from fishing. She showered and went to bed, but not before I told her something she might think about. If you think that I will tolerate this, you are very mistaken. When we get home, everything will change, or we won't be married anymore. Look, I'm sorry I offended you, but we'll talk tomorrow when you get back. The next morning, I got up early and went fishing. It was a good day, and I laughed and joked with the other fishermen. When we arrived back at the marina, I noticed that Juz's yacht had disappeared. I thought, well, thank God. I went up to our room and opened the door. The first thing I noticed was that all of Alex's things, which were usually on the dresser, were gone. I looked into the wardrobe, her clothes had also disappeared. She left. I sat on the bed, feeling sorry for myself and ready to cry. She had been acting like a real, expletive, for months now, but I still loved her. That's when I noticed two letters on my pillow. I took the one with her handwriting on it and opened it. Dear Rob, it shouldn't come as a surprise that I left. I've been unhappy for a long time. I know you tried, but I need more, and you just can't give me what I need. Juice was a breath of fresh air for me. He did everything I dreamed of, and he invited me to join him on a yacht and travel the world. I just couldn't refuse. This is what I've always dreamed of. He said we would travel first class and see all the places I had always wanted to see. Of course, this comes at a cost. So far, I have not cheated on you, but this will most likely change this evening, and it will continue to be so. I don't love Juice, and he doesn't love me either. It's just a partnership of convenience. When I'm done, I intend to return to you and our children, and we can grow old together as we planned. Please don't judge me, I just need it. I look forward to seeing you in the future. With love, Alex. I sat there in shock. How could she be so naive? Growing old together, asterisk not asterisk in this world. I opened the second letter. Dear Rob, Alex doesn't know I wrote this letter, but I thought it was worth explaining. I belong to a group of wealthy businessmen. We call ourselves the Syndicate. Every year, we choose a companion to join the circle, someone who will warm our bed. As soon as I saw Alex, I knew she was perfect for our group. Unsatisfied with her life and husband, I've been taking wives from their husbands for years. It's so easy, every woman has her own price. Find what she wants most, give it to her, and she will follow you anywhere and do whatever you want. I hasten to add that Alex has not yet been unfaithful to you, but tonight, she definitely will, or I will drop you off at the next stop. You're probably asking why I choose married women when I can get anyone. The answer is simple, I enjoy taking the wives of other men. I'll keep her for a year or two, and then trade her for another with one of the club members. She should return to you in about four years, that's how long they usually last. When she returns, she will be a rich woman. We will make sure of that. All her patrons will generously give her gifts, and the latter will give her at least a million dollars. We don't keep women over 40 because they start to wear out at that age. Please don't try to find me, because I sympathize with you and wouldn't want you to be punished. Your friend. Juice. I sat there, petrified, then began to tremble and finally burst into tears. I tried to repair my relationship with Alex, and I got punched in the gut for my efforts. To save our marriage, I lay there sobbing into my pillow until I fell asleep. The next morning, I woke up early. I no longer felt sad, only intense anger. I called the airline and changed my flight to an earlier one. I packed my suitcase and checked out of a hotel. I had lunch at the airport, but everything seemed tasteless. What would I tell the children? That their mother is a woman of easy virtue who abandoned them for a better life with another man? Everything was so confusing that I couldn't think clearly. Where a plane landed, I picked up the car from the long-term parking lot and drove home. On the way, I stopped at the store for milk and a microwave dinner, I couldn't eat on board, and was hungry. When I arrived at the house, the first thing I saw was Alex's car. I thought, this won't happen anymore. I went into the house, unpacked my things, 
cooked dinner, and poured myself a glass of wine. After eating, I looked around and noticed our wedding photo on the mantelpiece. I tried to remember the happy moments we had together, but I couldn't recall a single one. I realized that all the happy memories were clouded by the last terrible year I spent with her. As I sipped my wine, I thought about what I had decided to do. If she didn't change her attitude, I was going to get a divorce. I started laughing and couldn't stop. She did it for me. If I filed for divorce, she would get half of everything, plus the house and the children. I would be obligated to pay her child support. I am lucky, everything now belongs to me. All that remains is to agree on how to deal with the children. I went to bed in a much better mood, but still wanted to take revenge on Juice, at least a little. Well, what will be, will be. On Sunday morning, there was little I could do except cancel Alex's credit card and transfer all of our savings and joint account into my checking account. If she needs money, she has her personal account, or she can ask her boyfriend. I waited at home until the evening, so that when the children were already in bed, I could go to my in-laws. On the way, I was afraid of what I would have to tell them. Mike and Linda were like parents to me, and they always said I was the son they never had. I stopped in front of their house and went to the door. Mike opened it. Rob, we didn't expect to see you until next week. Did something happen? Where's Alex? He asked, looking around. Linda came into the living room. Where's Alex, Rob? Is she okay? Seeing their worried faces, I could not stand it and burst into tears, not because of my lost wife, but because of their lost daughter. I told them everything. Linda sat next to me and hugged me, while Mike stood behind me, placing his hand on my shoulder and squeezing it gently. When I regained my composure, I showed them the letters. After reading them, Linda sat crying, and Mike paced the room, looking angrier than I had ever seen him. Finally, he spoke. Rob, I'm sorry Alex did this to you. You know we've always considered you our son. Now we don't have a daughter. We lost her, but we will always have a son. He hugged me tightly. Linda came over and hugged us both. Rob, I agree with Mike. You are now our only child. You and our grandchildren are all that remains of our family. Please don't move away from us. You are always a welcome guest here and can stay as long as you want. When we parted ways, Mike made coffee and we discussed how to tell the kids everything the next day. The next morning, when the kids came down for breakfast and saw me sitting with a cup of coffee, they immediately ran into my arms. I could hardly hold back my tears. Samantha looked around and then looked at me. Pap, where's mom? Sit down, I need to tell you something, I said. I sat on one side of the kitchen table, Mike and Linda sat on the other and the kids were on their laps. This will be very difficult for you, but first, I want you to know that we all, including your mother, love you very much. I wasn't sure about their mother, but what else could I say? You know that mom always wanted to travel and see the world. She met a friend on our vacation, and he offered her the opportunity to make it happen. Mom went with him and will be gone for a while. But don't worry, your grandparents will help you, take you to school and pick you up. I'll try to change my work hours to spend more time with you, so things won't change that much for you. I paused to gauge their reaction and was amazed by Samantha's response. So, Dad, you want to say that she left us and left with another man? Her words shocked us all. She continued, well, one thing will definitely change. We won't have to tiptoe around anymore when she's around. We won't miss her. Never underestimate the insight of a ten-year-old girl. We all sat there stunned by her reaction. It was as if we were seeing Samantha suddenly eight years older. Well, shall we have breakfast or what? We need to go to school, she added, completely calmly. I looked at Carl. He clearly didn't fully understand what was happening, but apparently, he took his sister's example and was ready to follow her mood. While Linda was preparing breakfast and helping the kids get ready for school, Mike came up to me. Well, it went better than I expected. Was she really that difficult to communicate with? For me, yes, I replied, but I didn't know it had such an impact on the children. However, things could have been worse. Mike said he would take the kids to school and pick them up later so I could go to work and take care of business. 
When I arrived at work, I decided to go straight to my boss, but his secretary, Sarah, said that he wasn't there and suggested I go see Mr. Jamson, our general director. When I arrived at his office, his assistant immediately escorted me inside. Ah, Rob, I didn't think you'd be back so early. Why did you arrive so soon? Well, Mr. Jamson. Stop. When we're alone, call me Phil, he said. So, what happened? I explained the situation to him. He expressed how much he regretted it, but then noted that there was a bright side. While I was on vacation, my boss had suffered a minor heart attack and wouldn't be returning to work anytime soon, so I had been assigned his duties indefinitely. This meant I would no longer have to travel to clients or resolve problems, and I would also receive the same salary as my boss until he returned. He also suggested that I take the rest of the week to sort out my financial and personal matters. This was great news. Now, I could spend more time with my children and be flexible with my schedule. I then went to H and removed Alex from the insured list, making the children my primary heirs and immediate family members. I also made an appointment with my lawyer for the next day. My lawyer was an old friend from college, James Slack, who specialized in family law and also handled my day-to-day -day legal affairs. He greeted me cordially and offered me coffee. As we sat down to drink it, he started talking. So, Rob, I guess this is more than just a friendly meeting. What's on your mind? I explained what happened and gave him the letters. Okay, let's figure this out. You took Alex on vacation to improve your relationship, and she left you for a billionaire and just moved away. Is everything right? I confirmed. I assume you want a divorce? The sooner, the better, I replied. Sorry, Rob, but I can't file for divorce right away. All I can do is file for immediate legal separation. This way, you will no longer be responsible for her debts. If she returns within a year, you can serve her with notice. Otherwise, you'll have to wait a year and divorce her for leaving the family. I assume you want sole custody of the children? There is absolutely no way she will have them, I said bitterly. Hey, take it easy, tiger. This shouldn't be a problem. Her letter to you proves that she doesn't care about their well-being. I'll serve that, too. By the end of the week, you will have broken all ties with her. How did her parents take it? They disowned her and accepted me into their family, I said with a slight chuckle. Rob, you seem to be taking this pretty calmly. Are you sure you want to go that fast? James, to be honest, the divorce has been brewing for a year. This vacation was my last attempt to save our marriage, and we both know how it turned out. Okay, if you're sure, I'll submit the documents as soon as they're ready. I'll also publish a notice in local and several national newspapers that you are no longer responsible for her debts. On your way out, go see Joy. She's the secretary and a notary. She'll give you a list of financial issues that need to be resolved. Say hi to Helen, your wife, and give the kids a hug for me. Oh, damn, I didn't think about Helen. You do understand that she will be waiting for you at dinner every time she finds you a new date? He laughed. Tell her I'm not ready yet. Let her wait until my divorce is final, and then she can set me up with anyone. As long as she cooks dinner, she's the best cook I know. When I got home, I looked at the list Joy gave me and realized that I had already completed all the items except one. I called the finance company where Alex took out a loan to buy her car and told them they better take it now, because there would be no money to pay the dues. I also told them to contact my lawyer for more information. I looked at my watch and realized that Mike would soon pick up the kids from school. Where had the day gone? Mike brought the children half an hour later and left. I still hadn't bought any groceries, so I took the kids to McDonald's and warned them that this would not become a regular practice. When we got home, we watched the Frozen DVD together, what else? Then, the children went to bed. I kissed them goodnight. Carl said, oh, dad, and Samantha said, I love you. Afterward, I went downstairs, grabbed a beer from the refrigerator, turned on some soft jazz music, and sat down to sip my beer. Suddenly, I realized I felt much calmer than I had in a long time. I even raised a toast to Juice for taking Alex away. What a great way to get rid of a wife. The trouble started when Rob made a reservation at a restaurant on stilts. 
When we were almost turned away, I was embarrassed to the core and angrier than ever. Then Juice came to our rescue. He was everything Rob was not, sophisticated, charming, and, of course, very rich. I was immediately drawn to him and wished he was my husband instead of my socially awkward spouse. When Rob went diving and I stayed with Juice, I made my move. I put on the skimpiest swimsuit I had bought especially for Rob and thought, screw Rob, I'll seduce Juice. But my efforts were in vain. Juice did not react at all. I had almost given up when he suggested we have lunch on the beach. The crew served a full-service lunch, including a table and chairs. Just as we were starting to be served, Rob joined us. When he showed me the shells he had found for me, acting like a winner and humiliating Juice, I finally exploded and attacked Rob. He walked off down the beach in frustration, and that's when Juice made his move. Alex, I can't help but notice that you and Rob are having problems in your marriage. Do I understand correctly that it's about money? It's not just about money, but also about his attitude to life. He has no ambition and is content to just sit at his desk, waiting for the promotion that may never come. We were going to travel and see the world, but I got pregnant, and that all evaporated. I hate my life. It's so boring. I go to work, come home to two fighting children and a boring husband. There's no excitement, just one boring day followed by another. Sorry, you probably don't want to hear about my problems. How long will you stay in Miami? Please, don't worry about telling me about your problems. Actually, I may have a solution. And what's that? Alex, if you had the opportunity to travel around the world in first-class comfort, but to do this, you had to leave your family and sleep with another man for a year or more, would you agree? Don't answer me now. Think about it. Tomorrow, I'm going shopping, and I want you to keep me company. Just you, without any obligations, of course. I happily agreed to his proposal, although I already knew what my answer would be, but I didn't want to seem too approachable. That night, I gave Rob one of my sleeping pills to help him sleep. I spent the entire next day with Juice, enjoying the luxury. We went shopping, he spent a fortune on me. Then we went clubbing. On Thursday, when I returned from the club, I told Rob that we would talk when he returned from fishing the next day. Rob got up early and went fishing, and I immediately called Juice and asked him to help me with my luggage. I sat down and wrote Rob a goodbye letter, and when Juice arrived, I took my things out to the taxi. When we got to his yacht and set sail, I thought about how Rob would open my letter and how upset he would be. I started to feel guilty, but I reminded myself of all the wonderful places I had to see, and the guilt disappeared. When we left the dock, we were sitting on the lower deck, and Jews asked for my wallet. I held it out, not understanding why he needed it. He turned it upside down, went through the contents, and took out his credit card, debit card, and passport. Then he threw the cards overboard, saying, You don't need them anymore, but I'll keep this. He said, pointing to the passport. I was stunned. He had just basically erased my old life. Now... I was completely dependent on Juice for everything. I had always been an independent woman, but that changed in an instant. As I watched the shore disappear into the horizon, I wondered what I had gotten myself into. I was soon to find out. We were served dinner by one of the crew members. I don't remember exactly what we ate, but I remember that the wine was the best I've ever tasted. It was time to go to bed, and I began to wonder how the sleeping arrangements would be organized. Juice called one of the crew members. Show Mrs. Price to her cabin. I'm sure she wants to shower and change. I thought this was the answer to my question, but how wrong I was. Alex, I made sure to buy you a new wardrobe. Your old clothes were thrown away earlier. I hope you enjoy my selection, especially the lingerie and nightgowns. I'm waiting for you to choose one for tonight. But for now, I have things to do, so see you later. He made it clear that he expected me to spend the night with him without even kissing me. When I entered my cabin, I saw my suitcases in the corner, but they were empty. I opened the cabinets to see what he had bought for me. The clothes were all from top brands and fit perfectly. The underwear and nightgowns looked like they were meant for a honeymoon. I've never worn anything this revealing, not even for Rob, let alone a near stranger. I chose a sheer set, feeling as nervous as a bride on her wedding night. 
I thought about emailing the kids to explain something, but my laptop wasn't in the cabin. There were several books on the shelf, and I started reading one of them at random. A couple of hours later, there was a knock on the door, and Juice entered without waiting for an answer. How gorgeous you look in your outfit, he said. He came up to me and took my hand. Alex, you look stressed. Surely you knew what to expect. There are no free lunches. I did as he said. Very good. I thought he would stay the night, but he left soon after. I lay there, feeling used and abandoned. The night was good, but no better than with Rob, and I missed the intimacy of cuddling afterward. But it was all part of what I signed up for, and now I had to live with it. I thought idly about my husband and children, whom I might never see again. Then the tears began to flow. Juice kept his promise. We visited all the islands, dined in the best restaurants, and went shopping in the most expensive boutiques. Juice bought me expensive jewelry and clothes and showed me all the sights. When we left the last island, Juice said we would head to Europe before the weather turned bad. He said we would dock in the UK and go to London for a party. We had an intim almost every night, but it was just a repeat of our first time. We docked in Liverpool and went on excursions like ordinary tourists. We then headed to London and docked at St. Catherine's Pier. Juice showed me all the main sights in London, and I was delighted to see everything I had dreamed of. Alex, I want you to look especially pretty tonight. We're going to a party, and you'll meet other men like me and their dates, like you. I wore an emerald silk dress with a thigh high slit and rubies that Juice gave me. I looked in the mirror and thought, yes, I would sleep with myself. I immediately blushed, realizing what that meant. The Rolls Royce picked us up from the dock and took us to a very exclusive club. The syndicate, as I was later told, is what we belong to. We rented the entire club for the night. When we entered, there were about 20 men, each with a beautiful woman. Everyone sat on the edges, leaving the dance floor in the center. Many men waved to Jews, and some women did, too. A smooth jazz band was playing, and several couples were slow dancing. As I was watching, one of the men began to act very openly toward his partner. I was shocked to see how the dancing couple allowed themselves to open up in public. Juice led us into a booth, and we sat down opposite a man of about 50 who was with a woman no older than me. As I looked around, many couples were doing similar things, and I began to wonder if I would have to do the same. Juice looked at me strangely, as if trying to gauge my reaction to all this depraved behavior. When Jade, as I later learned her name, returned, we met Jade's partner, Charles. He was a very wealthy stockbroker, and their arrangement was similar to ours. Juice and Charles went off to talk to other men at another table, and Jade spoke to me. So, Alex, how long have you been in the circle? I don't understand. What circle are you talking about? Oh, then you must be new. Let me explain. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I bet you were on holiday with your husband and just just happened to befriend you both, right? How do you know? This is his style. He finds a middle-class couple with a beautiful wife and focuses his attention on her. He manages to separate them and then charms his wife, offering her everything she can never have with her husband. He takes her to the most expensive restaurants and boutiques, essentially buying her from her unsuspecting husband. Don't get me wrong, he will give you everything he promised and more, but it will come at a cost. Now you belong to him, you no longer make decisions about what happens to you, so just go with the flow. How old are you, 34 or 35? They don't keep you in the syndicate for more than 40 years, by which time you will have become rich by our standards. The only condition for a man to join the syndicate is that he must have a net worth of more than a billion dollars. Women should be married and beautiful. For them, taking a wife from her husband is a trophy, and every time they have an intimate with you, they think about your cuckolded husband. You can't change your mind. You don't have access to money, they take care of that and hold your passport so you can't escape. Do you see how they talk? They're discussing who to swap with whom. You see. They exchange companions so that intim doesn't get boring. One day, Juice will exchange you for another wife, and you'll have a new master. Yes, I said master, because we are nothing more than women of easy virtue, well paid, but still women of easy virtue. Sometimes, perhaps even tonight, the meeting turns into a party, and you're expected to sleep with anyone who asks. 
Sometimes you may be given to servants as a reward for some service to your master. Never complain, and you will be rewarded. I've been in the syndicate for two years now, and I've had three masters. I have over a million dollars worth of jewelry and a house in Chelsea with a Porsche in the garage. I'm 38 years old, so I still have time to double this. I was also told that the last owner I would have would give me a generous check when I was abandoned. The price for this is that you and I will never have our own families, no grandchildren, and we will probably end our lives alone. So, enjoy it. It's great now, but over time it gets boring. For example, tonight you saw me pretending to stroke his ego. Charles is a good guy and treats me well. Thank God, he doesn't like weird stuff like some of them do. Look, they're coming back. If they ask, I'll tell you how wonderful everything is here. That night, the meeting actually turned into what Jade had said it would be. The next morning, I woke up alone in my bed and thought, what have I done? I went downstairs for breakfast, but it turned out that lunch was already being served. It was almost 1.30 p.m. I waited for just to come, but instead, a young man of Middle Eastern appearance sat opposite me and introduced himself as Prince Osman. But everyone called him Aussie. He said I was traded and now belonged to him. He didn't have a yacht, but his private jet was no less luxurious. He was particularly interested in my past life and wanted to know about my intimate life with Rob. I realized that he wanted me to compare him to Rob in his favor, so I downplayed Rob by saying that Aussie was a much better lover, which seemed to satisfy his ego. Over the next six months, he took me to Egypt and showed me all the wonders of that country. Thanks to his wealth and status, we were even allowed to enter the pyramids. We traveled almost all the time and attended parties twice more with other members of the syndicate, but fortunately without night. This was the second time I saw Paris. The first time was with Jews, and when I first saw the Eiffel Tower, I was delighted. The same with the Louvre. But as they say, once is enough. The novelty wore off, but I still enjoyed the restaurants and shopping. Two years later, it all became boring. The high-class life was boring, but I grew rich by choosing the most expensive jewelry and clothes I could find. I was already with my fourth owner, the Greek ship owner, Alexander. Irony of fate, one evening, to his horror, he loaned me to his bodyguard for the night. Unlike Alexander, he was rude, had terrible breath, and smelled awful. After he left, I showered for over an hour but still felt dirty. But he bought me a house by the sea in Malibu. At the beginning of my fourth year, I learned from one of the girls that Juice had left the syndicate for health reasons. I smiled. He was an idiot who seduced me in the first place, although, come to think of it, it was more my fault. Night had now become boring. I was eager to get as much as possible from my master because I would soon turn 39 and I was waiting to be thrown away. I even began to look forward to this moment. Such a life no longer attracted me. I often fell asleep in tears thinking about Rob and the children. Samantha was about to become a young woman, and I wouldn't be there to guide her. I regretted what I had done every day and what I had to pay for it. When I turned 39, I was traded again, this time to Charles, an English stockbroker I met at my first party. Jade told me about his preferences and how he was very generous. I spent the next eight months with him. I was four months away from turning 40, so it was no surprise when one day he said it was time to leave the syndicate. To say I was relieved would be an understatement. Although my time with him was pleasant and not too demanding, we were in his penthouse in London when he told me the news. He said I could stay there until my affairs were settled and gave me a parting gift. It was a numbered account in Switzerland. He also said that at my house in Malibu, there was a surprise waiting for me in the garage. He mentioned that all my owners, yes, he did say owners, had deposited money into this account, and now I was worth over $6 million. He advised me to see an investment advisor to get the most out of my money. He then told me that all my other belongings, including jewelry and such, were in storage in Malibu and gave me the address and password. He handed me back my driving license and passport, and also gave me a British bank debit card. He said I might need some cash, and handed me £5,000 in cash, adding that there was another £50,000 in the account. Then he kissed me on the cheek and left. That was it. I was free to continue my life. 
I explored London as a free woman and visited all the places I had not seen before. At first, it was strange to be alone, but then I felt that being free was good. I booked tickets to Malibu and packed two suitcases. I boarded my flight, first class, of course, and prepared to return home to Rob. I went to bed early that night, it had been a busy day, and the fatigue had accumulated over the past week. I woke up rested and happy. Everything was starting to come together, and life seemed wonderful. I fed the children and took them to school. They didn't seem to miss their mother at all. I decided to talk to their director about our new situation and made an appointment for that same day. When I arrived at the appointed time, I was immediately shown inside. I explained the situation, and the director's face showed shock. I asked if the children should see a psychologist. Normally, I would say yes, but let's wait until they get used to the idea and see how it affects their grades or behavior. For now, I will let their teachers know about your situation, and they will keep an eye on them. I left feeling much more relaxed, knowing that the children would be looked after by professionals. It's been six months since Alex left, and it couldn't have been better. The children's grades even improved, and teachers were pleased with their progress. My promotion became official because my boss took early retirement, as James had predicted. Helen invited me to several dinners and introduced me to several single women. However, I was not ready for a new relationship and did not contact any of them, although I enjoyed Helen's cooking. James said she wouldn't give up until I was happily married again. I replied that I was looking forward to her culinary masterpieces but would not date until I got a divorce. Alex never tried to contact me, the kids, or our friends, as if she no longer existed. One day, I was sorting out papers and came across a package with a delivery notification. At first, I didn't remember when I received it, but when I opened it, I remembered it arrived just after I returned home. It was a stamp album that I had left for appraisal before we went on vacation. When I read the letter attached to the parcel, my pulse quickened. It turned out that the collection contained very valuable stamps. My father had left it to me after his death, along with an estimate of its value for inheritance. I had sent it to a reputable auction house with a request to sell as many stamps as needed to cover our vacation expenses. They sold only one stamp, which was enough to cover all expenses, and the rest turned out to be worth their weight in gold. The appraiser wanted me to contact him to discuss the sale of the remaining stamps. I made an appointment for the following week and tried to estimate their value online. I was stunned to learn that one of the British stamps was extremely rare, and one of these had been sold at a Sotheby's auction in England for over a million pounds. Of course, I realized that mine probably wasn't worth that much, it was probably a fake. I left the children with their grandparents and went to New York for the meeting. I was accepted immediately, and the appraiser shook my hand. Well, Mr. Price, we finally meet. I must say, your collection has aroused great interest. You have some very rare stamps, some of which were considered non-existent. We thought all the black pennies were accounted for, and to find two stamps that had remained stuck together was incredible. Of course, we thought they were fake at first, but after two experts confirmed their authenticity, we were very excited. In short, we would like to auction the entire collection at our London branch. We will first have to figure out whether it would be better to sell them individually or as a collection. But why in England? I asked. If you sell them in the US, you will lose a significant amount in taxes. However, if you sell them in England and deposit the money into a numbered account abroad, no US tax will apply, as long as you keep your money outside the US. There are no taxes. I can't say anything more because I'm already walking on thin ice, but if you contact this person, he will help you. He gave me a business card that said financial advisor. When you're ready to sell, contact me and I'll get the process started. I paid for his services, which were not cheap, and left, promising to contact him later. I actually contacted him. His name was Guy, and he listened to my story. Okay, you're divorced, you have a stamp collection that's worth millions, and you want to hide the proceeds. Right about like this? What can you do for me? It's actually easier than you think. When you receive the check, you will deposit it into a numbered account, for example in Serbia. The money will then be transferred to several other banks in Eastern Bloc countries, and from there to a numbered account in the Cayman Islands. 
you can then withdraw amounts under £99,000 to a Western bank several times a year. You will receive a Visa card that can be used all over the world, and you will live off this money. For larger purchases, you can use a bank transfer through a third party or an offshore account. Just call me when you're ready, and I'll arrange everything. Questions What if I need cash? No problem. Withdraw as usual via the Visa card. You can even open an account at a local bank and transfer money there. As long as the amount does not exceed £9,000, no one will pay attention to it. I walked out feeling like a trader hiding his money, but that was essentially what I was going to do. A year passed, and I divorced Alex for leaving the family. Three months later, I was free. Helen threw a party for my divorce, and this time, she invited several single women at once. She told me to pick one and at least start dating her to remind myself of what I was missing out on. I had been celibate for over a year and was already looking forward to getting back into the dating world. The party was informal, so slacks and an untucked shirt were appropriate attire. Of course, informal style for women meant better dresses and makeup, you can't win with women. The party was a great success, as you'd expect, with Helen doing the catering. Some of the women she invited were divorced, and some were simply lonely. A couple of them showed interest in me, but none of them attracted me. Midway through the evening, Helen introduced me to her cousin, Carol. I felt an instant attraction, and something slipped between us. She was about 5 feet 7 inches tall with long red hair, weighed about 110 pounds, with green eyes and a face like a mischievous elf. Later, she told me that she worked as a realtor for a local company. We hit it off immediately and spent the rest of the evening talking and dancing. She gently rejected several men who asked her to dance. At the end of the evening, we were the last to leave. I was a little drunk, but she was sober because she didn't drink, she had to drive. She offered to give me a ride home, and I gratefully accepted. When we said goodbye, Helen had a pleased grin on her face, and James gave her a thumbs up and a wink. Carol noticed all this, and I apologized to my friends. Carol found this extremely funny and told me about it. When we arrived at my house, I got out of the car, thanked her, and got ready to go inside. Will you at least invite me for a glass of something before bed? She said, already getting out of the car and heading toward the front door. I stood there stunned until she took my arm and pulled me toward the door. I opened the door with shaking hands, let us inside, and turned on the light. Carol stood in the center of the room, looking around. For a man with two children, your house is very clean. I'm impressed, she said, then walked into the kitchen as if she had lived there all her life. I followed her like a lost puppy. Before I could explain anything to her, she had already opened the cabinets, found two mugs, made cocoa, and put on the kettle. I sat down at the kitchen table, not understanding what was happening. She leaned against the countertop and looked into my eyes. I'm not usually that assertive but Helen said that if I don't show initiative, you'll just wish me good night and I'll never hear from you again. I understand that you're weary now after your previous relationship, but I'm not like your ex and I want to try to start a relationship if you want to. I looked into her eyes and saw her fear of rejection. I wondered why she would really like this, but I was afraid that she would consider me a pathetic option. What I don't understand is why such a beautiful woman would want to date a man with two kids and a lot of problems. Firstly, I love children, and secondly, I also have my own problems, which is why I never got married. Here's why, if you're interested. I was once taken advantage of without my consent. I became pregnant, but the child died at birth, and I forever lost the opportunity to become a mother. So, if you want more children, we'd better say goodbye right now. Before I knew what I was doing, I was standing and hugging her. I'm so sorry, I didn't know. And in an answer to your question, no, I don't want more children. Two are enough. At that moment, the kettle boiled, and Carol prepared the drinks. I took my mug and went to sit at the table. Oh no, you won't leave so easily, Mr. Price, she said. We have a sofa in the other room. Let's go there. I sat down on the sofa, and she sat next to me, placing the mugs on the coffee table. Then she snuggled up to me, resting her head on my shoulder and looking at me with tears shining in her eyes. We sat there for a few seconds, just looking at each other. Well, are you going to kiss me or not? 
I didn't need to be told twice. There was no intimate, and after about an hour, she said it was time to leave. I walked her to the car and watched her drive away, thinking it was time to move on. After that night, we started seeing each other about once every two weeks, dinner, dancing, sometimes a movie. About three months later, we were sitting on my couch when she asked, Do you find me attractive? I think you are one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen. Why are you asking? We've been dating for three months, and you still haven't asked me to bed. What's wrong with me? In response to her question, I took her hand and led her to the bedroom. We were without anything in record time. While I was in the bathroom, she must have woken up because, when I returned, she looked at me and said, your wife gave it up for another man. She was definitely crazy. After what you gave me, I will never let you go. I climbed back into bed, we cuddled, and then we fell asleep. The next morning was Saturday, so neither of us had to go to work. Carol made coffee and toast before saying she needed to go home to change and asked if we could meet later. I said I needed to pick up the kids. I also mentioned that it was time for her to meet them and that I needed to talk to Alex's parents about having a new woman in my life. When I arrived at Mike and Linda's, I was as nervous as a cat caught in a crowd of swaying chairs. The kids were playing in the backyard and I asked Mike and Linda if we could talk. You know how much I love you. You are like my parents but you are also Alex's parents. I've been hiding something from you for the last three months. I need you to know that I'm dating a woman, and it's getting serious. I didn't know what to expect, but they looked at each other and then pulled me into a three-way hug. Rob, we are so happy for you. It's time to leave Alex in the past and move on. When can we meet our future daughter-in-law? Wait, we haven't gotten that far yet, but it's serious, I replied. Linda spoke up. Rob, you're going to have to tell the kids, and if not here, bring her to Sunday lunch to introduce her to them and her future in-laws. Don't even try to say no. We insist, and we can't wait to meet her. I told Carol that she would have to meet my entire family at once. But instead of being afraid, she seemed excited. We arrived at Mike and Linda's around noon and were greeted at the door by happy faces and my children. As soon as we entered, the kids ran up to me and almost knocked me down. Mike and Linda hugged Carol and told her she would always be welcome in their home. I introduced Carol to the children as my special friend. Samantha asked, you mean like your girlfriend? Well, she really is a girl, and she's my friend, so I guess you're right. Dad, I'm already twelve, not five. I understand the difference. She's definitely your girlfriend, not just a friend who's also a girlfriend. I stood there not knowing how to respond until Carol walked up to Samantha, and they high-fived each other. Carol looked at me with a smug smile as if to say, well, now try to refute this. Mike and Linda could hardly contain their laughter when Carl interrupted. Does this mean you'll be our new mother? I almost fainted at his words and looked at Carol in shock, but she just laughed and said, well, answer him and let's put everyone out of their misery. I looked around for inspiration but found nothing. I took a sip of my drink and replied, well, this place is open if she wants to take it. I looked at Carol, and she replied, if this is a proposal, then yes. And by the way, you've been working towards this for a long time. You don't have a ring. I suppose Linda chimed in, wait a minute. She went upstairs, and Mike was smiling so hard his face must have hurt. When Linda returned, she handed me the box with the ring and whispered that it was her grandmother's ring. Now, young man, do it properly. I got down on one knee and said, Carol, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife? I opened the box with the ring. Yes, and a thousand times more yes. We hugged and kissed until Mike cleared his throat. Well, now that that's settled, how about lunch? Carol looked at the ring on her finger and smiled, while Linda said it was temporary until she found something she liked. Carol looked at her in surprise. This is the perfect ring. I love it already. Can I leave it? Linda replied, Of course, dear, if you really like it. I offered it to Alex, but she wanted something new. I'm so glad you like it. You are now officially a member of our family. We now have not only a son, but also a daughter. The children quickly became attached to Carol like a fish to water, and it was difficult for me to attract her attention. 
We sat down to lunch, and Carol helped clear the table while Mike and I sat on the porch with beers. Son, she seems like a good girl. Linda and I are so happy for you and the kids. Tell me about her. I told him everything, from our first meeting to today. When I returned inside, Carol was nowhere to be found. When my mother saw me looking for her, she told me to look in Carl's room. I got up and found them all playing on his Xbox. Samantha cheered Carol on as she and Carl raced around the virtual landscape. I decided not to interrupt them while they worked things out and went back downstairs. Mom came up to me. Son, I think you will succeed. The kids already adore her, and so do we. She hugged me and left. I came here with the excitement of meeting the family, and they took everything into their own hands. I came in as a single father and left engaged to a beautiful woman. My life changed in a matter of hours, and I was still trying to catch up with everything. Carol insisted that I take her home so we could discuss what had happened with the children. When we got home, it was almost time to put them to bed, so I told them to get ready for bed, and then we'd talk. So, what do you guys think of Carol? I want to hear the truth, even if it hurts me. Samantha replied, Dad, I really like her. She looks more like an older sister than an expectant mother, Samantha said. She said she was going to take me shopping for new things on Saturday. It sounds fun, but remember, don't take advantage of her generosity, okay? Carl added, Dad, she's awesome. She even beat me at my own game of Mario. When is she moving in with us? Take your time, Tiger. We're not married yet, I replied. Oh, Dad, be realistic. We're not stupid. You know we see this all the time at school. Divorced parents live with their boyfriends or girlfriends, Samantha said, rolling her eyes. Carl covered his mouth, trying not to laugh. Well, I was put in my place. I thought it was time for them to have a mother who would keep order and instill family values. I managed with Carl, but with Samantha, it was much more difficult. She needed constant female influence. Even after Samantha's comment, Carol never stayed overnight if the children were at home. It didn't seem right. Six months later, we got married. It was a small ceremony with our small family and a few close friends. Mike drove us to the airport for our honeymoon in London. The reason we chose London was simple. Firstly, we wanted to enjoy the English atmosphere, and secondly, on the third day of our stay, there was going to be a stamp auction. Yes, I planned all this with Carol's approval. Another thing worth mentioning, when I told Carol about the stamps, she insisted on a prenuptial agreement. She didn't want me to worry about leaving her without anything. God, how I love this woman. Our honeymoon was wonderful. We saw all the sights and visited all the must-see places. Carol especially liked the world of Harry Potter and the Tower of London. The auction took place during the second week of our honeymoon, and I met a guy. He stood up as I entered, and we shook hands. So, Mr. Price, what is it like to be rich? He asked. I don't know yet, I replied. I didn't even find out how much they were sold for. He looked at me as if I had come from another planet. With his mouth open, he collapsed back into his chair. Oh my God, are you serious? My clients usually know how much they've earned down to the last penny. You really don't know? No. I don't have the slightest idea. Why don't you enlighten me? Fine. They were sold separately, and after all expenses, including mine, you are now worth over 9 million British pounds, which is equivalent to about 11 and a half million US dollars. Now, it was my turn to fall into the chair, mouth open. I couldn't wrap my head around that amount of money. The children were provided for for life, and any financial problems were a thing of the past. I started laughing. What's so funny? He asked. I just thought that if Alex had waited, she could have had everything she wanted without having to sell her body. I then told the guy about my situation, and he laughed too. Karma is such a, underscore underscore, he said, and we laughed again. He said he opened a numbered account and gave me the details to access the funds. He also gave me a folder with instructions on how to set up the transactions. Finally, he said I should open two separate bank accounts in my name and Carol's name at different UK banks, and he would transfer £900,000 to each of them so we could enjoy the money immediately. 
I thanked him and said I would contact him when I told Carol about this. She almost fainted. I had to bring her a glass of water. We arrived in London with one suitcase between us to avoid exceeding the allowed luggage weight. We returned with four rolling suitcases, not caring about the overweight charge. When we returned home, we each had at least a dozen gifts, which we unwrapped to the joyful screams of the children. Over the next year, we moved to a better area and bought a bigger house with a pool. When people asked where we got the money, I said that my uncle, whom I never knew, died and left me a fortune since he had no other relatives. This satisfied everyone. I paid off Mike and Linda's mortgage and began gradually putting small amounts into the bank, as I had been advised. We both continued to work because we thought we would be bored sitting at home and spent little except on exotic vacations with the kids. One day, while looking through my finances, I was amazed. Even though I had spent quite large sums, not only had I not reduced my principal, but I had not even managed to spend the interest. Sometimes, I would remember that vacation with Alex and get angry. It wasn't that she left me, I was okay with that. I was angry that another man had taken her away from me. He had done this many times to other couples and had ruined many lives. It occurred to me that I had no way of doing anything about it before, he was out of my reach, and I couldn't touch him. I decided that I wanted to get revenge for all the lives he had ruined and came up with a plan for revenge. As an engineer, I'm used to solving problems, so I made a list of what I needed to do. 1. Find him. 2. Decide what kind of revenge is right for him. 3. Find help to carry out my revenge. 4. Do everything through a third party. 5. He must not find out that I am taking revenge on him, or else he will come after me with all his money. 1. Not finding him was easy. I hired a private investigator in the Bahamas to track him down. I gave him the name of his yacht and told him I wanted to know when he was coming back to the Bahamas. The detective said it would be easy, as a yacht of that size would have to be equipped with a tracker. I told him I wanted to know as soon as he headed toward the Bahamas. 2. Revenge had to fit the crime. I thought about it for a long time, and in the end, I decided that I needed to stop him from hunting other couples, but I didn't want anything violent. I didn't want the law to interfere. Finally, I came up with the perfect solution. I told Carol that I needed to regain my dignity and that I was going to get revenge on Jules. She wasn't too happy, but she said she understood and asked me not to do anything that could harm me. I agreed, and she calmed down. I booked a room at the same hotel we stayed at on our Bahamas vacation. 3 and 4 I was going to meet with the more shady parts of the city, so I hired Max's bodyguard. When I told him I wanted to meet the owner of the brothel, he asked why. I told him the truth, and he burst out laughing, nearly knocking me over by slapping me on the back. He said he knew the right person, and we went there. His name was Jose, and after I explained what I needed, he said he had the right girl. We all met and discussed the details and price. It would have cost me a lot of money, but it was worth it. Jose wanted everything in advance, but I said no, first, in advance, and the rest after completion. 5. I wasn't going to be around when everything happened. In fact, Jules wasn't supposed to find out that he had been deceived until he reached Europe. Now all I could do was wait. I received a call, Jules was heading back to the USA. I made several calls and started a chain of actions to carry out my revenge. Jules sat at his usual table, looking around at the arriving customers in search of a suitable match for his perverted game. While he was waiting, a man and a woman approached the table, and everything played out as if according to a well-practiced script. The maitre d'hotel looked at Jules, who nodded. The maitre d'hotel then made a show of saying that they didn't have a free table for the couple. The man looked upset, and the woman looked angry. Jules got exactly what he expected. He intervened and saved the situation. The hook was set. Three days later, the woman was already sailing on Jules' yacht. He won again. When they arrived in Europe, Jules went ashore alone, leaving the woman on the yacht. She left all her things in the cabin, went ashore, and told the crew that she needed to buy something for herself. She left and never returned. The man was waiting for her with another passport and they took off on a plane before Jules returned. When Jules returned, there was a letter on her bed. Dear Jules, You're probably wondering where your date is. 
Well, I'll tell you. A few years ago, I took my wife on vacation, and you stole her from me by pretending to be a friend. This is my revenge. You couldn't resist Elena, and when she walked into a restaurant with someone who wasn't her husband, you immediately struck. But this time, you were wrong and fell into my trap. I hope you enjoyed with Elena because she left you a little gift in the form of a virus. So enjoy it. I hope you die in agony, you pathetic piece of... All the worst. Rob. I received a message on my burner phone saying, Mission accomplished, and I made a call to transfer the remaining money to the numbered account. Revenge was complete. I felt like a weight had been lifted from me. Finally, I had regained my dignity and felt like a whole person again. The next two years passed peacefully in the Price household. We were the perfect family. Samantha started dating. I really didn't like it, and I wanted to scare her boyfriend, but Carol talked to her and assured me that everything would be okay. Carl was now 13, and he began to break boundaries, as boys do at that age. I took him hiking, fishing, and on other outdoor activities, sometimes inviting one of his friends along. He was crazy about football and played on the school team. Samantha was a cheerleader and the star of the drama club, starring in various productions at her school. Life was wonderful. And then this happened. James called me and told me that Alex was back in town and wanted to see me. Alex. When I arrived in Malibu, I went straight to my house, a gift from an oil tycoon, but I couldn't get inside because my code no longer worked. I called the real estate office that was monitoring the house, and they told me that the code changes every month and that I needed to come to their office to confirm my identity. It was almost 6 o'clock in the evening, and they were about to close for the night, so I called a taxi to the nearest hotel and booked a room for the night. The next morning, I went to the real estate office and received a new code. When I walked into the house, I noticed how big it was and couldn't help but think how great it would have been if our family had lived here. But my thoughts quickly ended, Rob would never agree to live in a house bought with money earned by my body. But I had to see him and the children I left five years ago. But would you want to see me? I could claim that I could provide a better future for the children and threaten to take them away if he didn't want to listen to me. I desperately wanted my old life back and was willing to do anything to get it. I spent the next few months wandering around my huge house. It wasn't a home, just a place to sleep. I decided to take a road trip back to Iowa. I was going to drive my Lamborghini 2000 miles home. I thought it would take me about a week. The first thing I learned about my Lumbo was that it has a very small trunk. I had to put my suitcases in the small back seat. Two days into the trip, my back started to hurt. The Lumbo was great for short trips, but long trips were clearly not its forte. I exchanged it for a BMW X5, a much more comfortable car. Even so, I quickly got tired and wondered how long-distance truck drivers managed to stay awake. Almost three weeks later, including a three-day stay at a luxury hotel where I was pampered, I finally made it there. The first night, I was sitting at dinner when a handsome man approached me and asked if he could have a seat. Previously, I would have happily agreed, but not now. I politely said I was waiting for my boyfriend, and he left. I didn't want to see any more men, except maybe Rob. When I got into town, I booked a room at the Sherrington Hotel. I took a suite to have more space to walk around. That night, I made plans to return to my family's life. The first thing, after breakfast, I went to our old house. I was sure they were still living there since Rob probably still couldn't afford to move. I was going to dazzle them with my wealth and make their dreams come true. When I arrived, there was no car near the house, so I thought that Rob's car was probably in the garage. It was Saturday morning, and he wasn't supposed to be at work. I rang the doorbell, and a middle-aged woman in a dressing gown appeared on the threshold. Hello, how can I help you? Does Rob Price live here? No, they moved about three years ago. Are you by any chance Alex? Yes, how do you know? Mr. Price said you might show up sometime and left a note for you. Wait here, I'll bring it now. She returned with a sealed envelope and handed it to me, then closed the door. I returned to my car and read the note. Asterisk Alex. If you are reading this, then you know that we have moved. Please don't try to find us. You won't be able to. 
If you need to discuss legal matters, my lawyer's business card is included, asterisk. I sat there stunned. Rob had moved on, and he didn't want me. Well, I shouldn't have been surprised. I abandoned him and the children. The paper became wet, and then I realized I was crying. I knew Rob's lawyer, James, and his wife Helen, and I knew where they lived, so I went to see them. I rang the doorbell, and Helen answered. When she saw me, her face turned red. What do you want here? A voice came from the depths of the house. Helen, who's there? It's James's wife. Who is this nobody? And she closed the door. I stood there with tears streaming down my face. This couldn't be real. My parents had disowned me. I got into the car and just drove aimlessly. An hour or so later, I found myself outside the city and saw a small gas station on the right, so I turned off. There was a cafe at the gas station, and I suddenly felt hungry. I hadn't eaten since breakfast, and it was already 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I gassed up the car and went inside, operating on autopilot. I sat down at a table, and a middle-aged waitress came up to me with a menu. I don't remember what I ordered, but while I was sitting and eating, drinking coffee, I began to shake and sob. The waitress, Cindy, came over and asked if I wanted to be alone. I simply nodded, and she took me to the backyard where it turned out to be her apartment. She sat me down and brought me some water, asking if I wanted to talk. I looked at her, at her friendly face, and everything spilled out. She didn't say a word until I finished. Honey, from what you said, I see that you made very bad decisions, and now you're paying for them. I don't know why you did what you did, but I see that now you regret it. I see that you need to close this issue, but things will get a lot worse before they get better. You need to apologize to everyone and then move on. They already did. Do you know how I know this? I, myself, once made a lot of bad choices. I got into bad company and took illegal substances. Later, I went to therapy, and my therapist told me the same thing I'm telling you. I did as he advised, and now I can live with myself. But I had to let my husband move on with his life. He is now married to someone else, but they still allow me to see our daughter whenever I want. I've been clean for two years now and intend to stay that way. You need to make peace with everyone you hurt and move on. Now, I'm not a professional, but if you want to talk again, you know where to find me. I returned to the hotel feeling a little better and decided to take her advice. On Monday, I made an appointment with James. They took me in right away. Before I could say anything, he raised his hand. Alex, I know what you want, but I can't help you. I called Rob and told him you wanted to see him, but he asked me not to give you his address. However, the children are still minors, and you have the right to see them. Rob agreed, albeit reluctantly. So, I'm going to set up a meeting with a court-appointed consultant. If all goes well, you may be eligible for visitation, but don't get your hopes up too high. Where are you staying now, so I can contact you? And it would be wise if you hired a lawyer. Personally, as a former friend, I have to ask, what were you even thinking? I sat there digesting what he said. I was going to see my children, but not the man I still loved. I agreed to his proposal and got ready to leave. I thought that Rob must still live nearby, so I decided I would find a house near him. It should be big enough for the children to stay with me if all went well. I looked up at James and realized he had asked me a question. I froze. What? What did you say? He repeated his question, and I blurted out everything that had accumulated inside me. When I finished, he looked at me like I was worse than dirt. Well, now it's clear why you didn't try to call anyone. But it's not clear why you left when you did. You burn many bridges, and you have no friends left in this city. Oh, and one more thing, the court ruled that you must return to your maiden name. I left the office feeling more optimistic about my chances of being reunited with my family. The next day, I went house hunting with hope in my heart. I found a nice four-bedroom house in a gated community in a good area. I started arranging it and decided I would let the children choose the furniture for their rooms if everything went according to plan. I hired a lawyer as recommended, and he told me not to get my hopes up, since I had clearly abandoned my family. I moved into the new house a week later and told James my new address. 
A few days later, my lawyer called me. A child welfare officer would be coming at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning with my children for a short meeting. If all goes well, the court would set a meeting schedule. I was delighted that everything was finally starting to go as it should. Saturday morning came, and I was a nervous wreck waiting for the doorbell to ring. It sounded exactly at 11 o'clock. I rushed to open the door and saw a pleasant-looking woman with two gloomy children. I invited them inside and offered them drinks, but they all declined. The social worker introduced me to my children, and then Samantha spoke first. We know who she is and what she did. Even though Dad says she still loves us, we remember the day he came home alone. He cried, but always made sure we were happy and never said anything bad about her. We know we have to be here, the court ordered it, and Dad forced us, but that doesn't mean we like it. Dad said the visit would last an hour, and we've been here for five minutes, so we still have 55 minutes left. What do you expect from us? Why should we rush into your arms? Forget it. We stopped loving you a long time ago, so stop pretending and let us go home to someone who loves us more than herself. The social worker and I were taken aback by her outburst. Then the social worker spoke to Samantha. Samantha, I know you don't want to be here, but your dad asked you to behave, and that was completely rude. The court said it's an hour, so you'll stay here for an hour. Understand? Samantha and Carl went and sat on the sofa, obviously sulking. I asked them about school and other activities but received only short answers or grumbling. Things were not going at all the way I had hoped, and I had no idea how to change things. Samantha kept glancing at her watch and finally announced that the time was up and they wanted to leave. Sarah, the social worker, looked at me sadly and nodded, signaling that it was time to finish. When they were about to leave, I remembered that I had gifts for each of them, so I went to get them. When I handed them the gifts, Samantha looked at me and said, We are not like you. You cannot buy us with gifts or money. They both threw their gifts on the sofa and left. Sarah saw my tears and said that, with time, everything would get better. She had seen this before. Then she added in a whisper, maybe it will help if you get a puppy. Rob called me and said Alex wanted to see the kids. I was against it, but he said she could get a restraining order. So, I asked him to try to limit their contact with her mother, which he did, also telling me her version of why she had been gone for so long. I felt a little sorry for her, but it was her fault. She arranged all of this herself. So, that's her problem. I explained to the children that they would have to see their mother. They said in unison, Carol is our mother, not her. She may have given birth to us, but she betrayed us long ago. I couldn't argue with their logic, so I remained silent. There were a lot of tears on the day of the meeting, and Sarah had to literally tear them away from Carol when it was time to go. I told them, this is your birth mother, so be polite. I'll see you later. When they returned, Sarah explained what had happened but advised them to continue meeting regardless. I didn't like them seeing Alex, but there was nothing I could do about it unless she did something wrong. The same scene repeated itself over the next six months. Alex even tried to win them over by buying a puppy. All she achieved was that the children now wanted to get a puppy. I talked them into adopting a teenage dog from a shelter. It was a mixed breed dog but mostly a Labrador. She quickly became part of the family, and we all loved her. Her name was Megan. Alex tried everything to connect with Samantha and Carl, but nothing worked. She even bought a puppy, a purebred beetle named Tom. They obviously liked it and played with it during visits, but they continued to ignore me. After six months, Sarah said I was beating a dead horse, and these visits were only making me and the kids sad. She advised me to refuse the court order, perhaps the children themselves would come to me over time when they grew up. I was lonely. No one I knew before even wanted to communicate with me. Of course, men approached me almost every day, but the last thing I wanted was to get into a relationship with someone again. I went into the cafe to see Cindy. She said I needed to unwind and took me to a country club. She wasn't interested in men either, although she didn't like them. She had problems after she was kicked out onto the street when she was an addict. We became good friends, and one day I invited her over for dinner. Tom was delighted with her, and she played with him while I prepared dinner. We repeated this several times, and I learned to dance the Lindy Hop at the club.
The house seemed empty when she was gone. Tom was good company, but the one-sided conversation wasn't much fun. After much consideration, I invited Cindy to move in with me, without obligation. She was hesitant at first but agreed on the condition that she would share the costs. I agreed, and we moved into the house together. Since I had no intention of leaving the area, I sold my house in Malibu and put the money in the bank. Cindy continued to work in the cafe. I suggested she quit because I had more money than I needed, but she wanted to pay her share. I saw that her work was exhausting her, and I was afraid she might return to her addiction. With these thoughts in mind, I turned to the realtor and asked him to find suitable premises for a country-style restaurant with a dance floor. It took several months, but they eventually found the right location in another part of the city. I took Cindy with me to evaluate it and asked for her opinion. She looked at everything carefully and made some suggestions about the dance floor, and I bought it. When I told her I had bought the place, she asked if I had experience running a restaurant. I said that I didn't, but I had a person who did. When she asked who it was, I replied, you. She sank heavily into the nearest chair. I, yes, you are. You have skills, and I have money. Together, we can do everything. What do you say? The next day, she handed in a resignation, and we began setting up our restaurant, hiring a cook and waitresses. It took up all of our time and kept me from dwelling on the past or worrying about Cindy. We made a big event out of the opening night and sent out invitations. It was an invitation-only evening, and I made sure Rob received his invitation. I was pretty sure he would come. I was thrilled when Sarah said that Alex had stopped trying to work things out with the kids. After that, everything calmed down, and I thought we would never hear from Alex again. Months passed, and I almost forgot about her existence when suddenly, one day, an invitation came in the mail to the opening of a new restaurant in another part of the city. I asked Carol if she wanted to go, and she happily agreed. We both loved country music and dancing, so we asked Alex's parents to take the kids until Sunday. Both they and the children were happy, the grandparents because they loved spending time with the children, and the children because they were spoiled. We got home early on Friday to get ready for the big night. I put on cowboy boots, a plaid shirt, and new jeans. Carol wore matching boots, a tied front Mustang shirt, and Daisy Duke-inspired shorts. When we arrived, we were shown to our table near the dance floor and given menus. The menu consisted of mostly country-style dishes with a few vegetarian options. The dinner was great, and while we were drinking beer from a bottle, the orchestra started playing a tune. Without hesitation, we were the first to hit the dance floor, and soon it was full. We danced about five dances and then returned to the table to rest. As the evening came to an end and the slow dancing began, we were watching the dancers when suddenly someone sat down at our table. I looked back, about to tell them to move, but I saw that it was Alex. She probably noticed my angry look and spoke. Rob, please don't leave because of me. I just want to say a few words, and then I'll leave you alone forever, I promise. I almost got up from my chair, but Carol put her hand on my shoulder. Rob, nothing will happen if you listen to her. If you still don't feel comfortable, we can leave. I sat back down, glaring at Alex. Okay, say what you want, and then leave. And one more thing, how did you know we would be here? To answer your question, this place belongs to me and my friend. As for what I want to say, it won't take long. Regardless, I want to apologize for my past actions. I was a selfish, expletive, thinking I could have it all and then come back to you and somehow make amends. Well, not everything went according to plan. Surely James told you what happened to me, and I probably deserved it. You may not believe me, but I have changed. That selfish woman is no longer there. I understand that you don't care, but I needed to clear things up between us. Both you and the children have moved on and now love your new wife, Carol. I am grateful to you for taking care of the family I left behind. Please love Rob as much as I now realize I did. It's probably true that we don't appreciate what we have until we lose it. Now I'll leave you alone to enjoy the rest of your evening. Oh, and in case you ever need anything, here's my business card. One more thing, I intend to keep an eye on the kids. I won't be obvious, and they won't see me, but I will try to attend as many of their events as possible. I know you can get a restraining order to stop me, 
But please, I beg you, let me at least do this. Then she just left. We didn't say a word. We stayed until closing and had a great time. We didn't see her again that evening and for a long time after that, too. Whenever we went to children's activities, we would look for her and sometimes notice a lone figure standing in the distance, or at performances where Samantha played, they saw a woman in disguise sitting in the back rows next to another woman with a video camera. One evening, there was a knock on the door. When I looked through the peephole, a woman I didn't know was standing on the threshold. I opened the door with the chain. How can I help? Hi, my name is Cindy. I'm Alex's partner at the restaurant. Can I come in? I opened the door and invited her to enter. Carol invited her to sit on the sofa and asked if she would like coffee. She agreed. So, how can we help you? First of all, Alex doesn't know I'm here, and I don't want her to find out. Alex and I live together as friends. She then told us her and Alex's life stories and how they met. We listened carefully, asked questions when necessary, and then she continued. Alex never misses an opportunity to see the children, usually from afar and sometimes closer, but in disguise. When she returns home, she cries into her pillow, regretting what she lost. I can tell you from personal experience that she is not the same woman who treated you so cruelly. She has changed. Like I said, I'm not without sin, and Alex gave me a second chance. I'm not going to let her down. I can't thank her with money, but I hope you'll consider giving her more time with the kids. Cindy, we don't forbid her to see the children. She tried, but they just don't want to make contact with her. She's just the one who cheated on their father and abandoned them. We both tried to talk them down, but they got upset and ran to their rooms. Are they at home now? Yes, they are in their rooms. And what I'd like to talk to them. Carol and I exchanged glances and shrugged. Carol went upstairs and talked with them for about 10 minutes. When she returned, she said that they agreed to talk to Cindy, but only with Carol present. We agreed, and I went out with a beer and sat by the pool. About half an hour later, I heard Cindy drive away, and Carol came out and sat next to me. Rob, the reason they don't want to see their mother is because they think it will betray you. We've come to an agreement, with your permission, the next time we have a barbecue, we thought we'd invite Cindy and Alex over and see how it goes. The children will feel more relaxed with us around, and their rooms will be upstairs. What do you think? As you know, I had tried to get them to see Alex, so I had no objection. But if she starts acting like the old Alex, she'll be asked to leave. Alex. I opened my email and was shocked to receive an invitation to a barbecue at Rob's house. The text was even more surprising. Rob and Carol invite you to a barbecue at the specified address on the specified date. Please come with a friend. I showed Cindy and asked her to come with me. We were instructed to arrive after 1 p.m. and not bring anything with us. On the day of the barbecue, I was more nervous than ever. The invitation said to dress casually, so Cindy and I wore slacks, sandals, and light sweaters. I rang the doorbell, feeling sick with anxiety, and waited for what was essentially just a few seconds. Carol opened the door, and we exchanged formal air kisses and a brief hug. Carol whispered in my ear, I have nothing against you. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be as happy as I am now. So let's try to be friends. That calmed me down a bit, but then I saw Rob. We looked at each other, and I wanted to run away, but Cindy grabbed my hand. Remember, we were invited. If he didn't want to see you, you wouldn't be here. When Rob approached, I extended my hand to him, but he ignored it and hugged me, exchanging a formal kiss as he promised so the children would see that he had forgiven me and that they should do the same. We were served drinks and went out to the pool. About eight children were playing in the pool, splashing loudly and laughing as they do when children are happy. We found a couple of sun loungers and sat down. Carol brought several other guests and introduced us, not as Rob's ex-wife, but simply by name, mentioning that we owned a new restaurant. This immediately sparked a conversation about the restaurant and its success. I was so carried away by the conversation that I forgot about my nerves and felt relaxed and content until Samantha and Carl came up to me. I didn't know what to say, so I just commented on how beautiful their house was. Samantha looked at Carl and he said, Tell me, you're better at this. 
Samantha sighed and began to speak. Daddy said he forgave you, and we should do the same. We will try, but don't expect that we will become close to you right away. First of all, Carol is our mother, so we won't call you mom. Maybe in time, we'll call you Aunt Alex. I know this is not what you wanted, but this is our best offer. As for seeing us, that will be decided by mom and dad. Against our beliefs, we are willing to give you a second chance, but if you start behaving like before again, we will sever all ties forever. Well, do you agree with our terms? I sat there, feeling happy and sad at the same time. I was stripped of my title as mother and demoted to aunt, but I was ready to accept whatever I could and become the best aunt in the world. I accept your offer. I promise to go slowly and not interfere in your life unless you ask. Can I at least kiss you on the cheek to say thank you? They let me do it and then went back to play with their friends. I was in seventh heaven and couldn't stop smiling. My children were part of my life again. I almost didn't notice Rob sitting down next to me. I only realized this when Cindy stood up and walked away. You should be grateful to Carol. She convinced us to give you a second chance, so don't screw it up. Rob, I'm not the same person anymore. I've learned my lesson over the past five years. I've changed, and I'm not going to ruin everything. Do you want us to leave? No, I have one last surprise for you, which will be here soon. A few minutes later, two people arrived and walked towards me. These were my parents. Mom spoke first. I think you know how disappointed we were in you and were ready to disown you forever. But Rob said he forgave you, and we should do the same. Your father and I discussed this and decided that it was time to leave bygones in the past and welcome you back into the family. After these words, they both hugged me tightly. I had never felt so happy in my life. I had a family again. Although Alex was accepted back into the family, she was never invited back to Rob and Carol's house. She saw the children regularly, and her relationship with her daughter began to resemble that of a relationship with a beloved aunt. When the kids had sporting events or school plays, she was invited to sit with Rob and Carol to watch. They never became friends, but they stopped being enemies. Alex regretted her actions for the rest of her life. She continued to live with Cindy, and their restaurant is called Two Broken Women Country Stop. What do you think of our story today? In my opinion this story was quite interesting, and I think the wife deserved the treatment she got. What's your impression? Let me know in the comments. See you in the comments.